everyone. Um, welcome this afternoon to the uh, to Amanda's presentation of her thesis research. Um, she just told me that her talk is really long, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll try to uh, keep my remarks brief and and get her up on the podium. Um, I want to welcome all the friends and family to the Marine Laboratory. I want to thank all the Moss Landing students for coming on a Wednesday afternoon in the, in the summer. And um, I want to also especially thank uh, Ivano Aiello and Pamela Branick, who hopefully is listening in live on air, um, the um, members of Amanda's thesis committee um, it's it's a it's a great opportunity for me to tell you, Amanda. Um, bye. <laughs> as, uh, as you sneak away, uh, how much I've enjoyed having you in the laboratory. You've you've really contributed a, a great positive energy to the lab. Um, you've you've done you've been so helpful um, managing our website, um, helping me with my projects, helping. Um, put together the seminar um, um, food spreads that, that our lab has been responsible for and helping out when um, other invert lab students had their defenses and now it's, now it's your turn. Um, there's, um, there's, there's so much I can say about what you've done here at the lab. Um, you know, besides um, the helping out in my laboratory, you've you've been on, um, you've been an officer of the student body government. You've been the liaison for the for the students to the marine program, and and helped organize the the marine symposium for for three years. And then you became the um, what is it the. The, the, the program assistant for the um, Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions that, that organizes the Marine Symposium. Um, you've, you've done a, just a ton of outreach things that you know, really set a standard for all of us. Um, you part of the, uh, the inaugural leadership committee for the Society for Women in Marine Science. You gone to high schools and given talks. Um, you've won <laughs> you've you've won numerous awards, the James Nybachan Memorial Scholarship, the Zephyus Martin Scholarship, a Myers Trust Award, an award from Coast, the Simpkins Family Science Scholarship. Um, and then last summer you you held a prestigious Science Communication Scholarship with KQED in San Francisco, and wrote exciting stories uh, for KQED, such as, these hairworms eat a cricket alive and control its mind. <laughs> and this adorable sea slug is a sneaky little thief. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I'll just add to that I'm, I'm delighted with the, the thesis topic that you chose because um, one of the reasons that I, I think I myself became a marine biologist was from the joy of looking at tiny little communities in a microcosm. I, mean, I can remember when I, I took zoology too as a freshman at UC Davis and looking through a microscope at an a overgrown abalone shell with all sorts of encrusting things on it and seeing all these tiny little things crawling in and around. And ever since then, I've always been fascinated by these tiny little microcosms and I've, I've, I've flown this idea of looking at myofauna to many students over the years and it just gives me great pleasure that, that you took it up <laughs> and took it to a place well beyond what I ever could have imagined. Um, when I started my studies way back then. So um, with that, I'm going to 
turn it over to you, Amanda. Um, geographic characterization of myofaunal communities along the California coast and potential abiotic drivers. All right. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I had lots of quippy remarks, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all of them. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and I, I wanted to start by talking about biodiversity, which is really just kind of a broader theme of the work that I'm doing. And you know, John just hinted at this idea of these microcosms that are extremely uh, abundant and speciose. And so biodiversity is really at its broadest, just the variety of life on Earth. And I, and I don't necessarily inherently think that we need you know, a, a scientific term to, to tell us you know, that there is a lot of life on Earth. Um, and you know, while, while I think many of us are familiar with this term, it's kind of made the jump into popular science. Uh, this, this word was not actually coined until 1968. And so when really famous naturalists like Darwin were running around collecting things and like shooting birds and stuff, they didn't actually have the language to talk about diversity in the way that we do now. Um, and so, you know, as we've kind of evolved our scientific methods, we've had to break down the way that we talk about it into um, these more descriptive terms. And uh, so, for example, we talk a lot about species diversity, which is really probably what you're thinking of when you hear that term is just the number of species in a given area. Um, but, you know, increasingly we can, we can talk about the way that species are interacting with their ecosystem or with their habitat. And, um, you know, uh, for example, a, a forest in Oregon is going to look a lot different from a forest here in California, and, and a lot of that is dictated by the, you know, the environment and, and its interaction. And so lastly is kind of this diversity of genes. And so rather than looking at diversity between species, you're looking at uh, diversity of genes within a species. And so my thesis research to an extent touches on all of them in the sense that I'm looking kind of more at the species diversity, uh, but I bring in some environmental variables to look at habitat and you know the, the underpinnings of genetic diversity are very central to how we go about identifying things. Uh, and so, you know, why does it matter? Uh, well, you know, our, our ocean provides us with a lot of, of services and things like that and, and biodiversity is kind of inherent in its ability um, to be successful at providing us with these services. So for example, you know, we we fish a lot of things, we fish a lot, and we've seen how when you fish out certain species, it has these ramifications for kind of the system as a whole. Um, and in following along with that, you know, if you look at something like this little hypothetical food web, um, diversity, it, it builds in kind of the ability of systems to be buffered. And, and by that, I mean, if you look at this, you know, there's, there's multiple species represented in this forage fish. And so if you pull one of them out, it's easier for the system kind of to recuperate from that loss and, and because there's kind of ecologically similar species to, to fulfill that role. Uh, and of course, as I was saying, you know, the only way we can talk about loss of diversity or particular kind of contextualized diversity is having a past insight to apply to the present, right? And so, you know, using things like museum collections is very useful um, at looking at changes over time. Uh, and so we, we've done, you know, we often look at species diversity really regionally or locally, but uh, we do have kind of some broader, broader um, theories about it. And so, for example, uh, this heat map where the, <clears throat> the warmer colors represent more diversity and the colder colors represent less uh, is highlighting a hypothesis called the latitudinal diversity gradient. And uh, I probably don't need to, again, use these words to explain what, what you probably already know, which is that if you look at some of these areas that are extremely diverse, they're areas that you recognize, like the Amazon rainforest and the Coral Triangle. And so this, this hypothesis is suggesting that in general, species diversity increases from the poles to the equator, right? And this is something that, again, we can kind of see um, visually. Uh, and so in California, uh, much of our diversity is tied up in the fact that we are an upwelling-driven system. Uh, and so we have kind of the California current, this cold water current, with persistent uh, north-south winds kind of moving down the coast, um, and as a result of those interacting with uh, the Coriolis effect, which is the way that things are deflected when the Earth rotates, so think of your toilet flushing in Australia, and, um, along, <laughs> along with Ekman transport, which is the propensity for surface water to move at a 90 degree angle to the prevailing wind, which in our case is offshore, um, we have this kind of deep, cold, nutrient-rich water upwelling up very close to shore. and so. That is reflected, and this is a chlorophyll map, and you can see really close to shore are these really productive, uh, productive zones. But 
when it hits the Southern California Bight at Point Conception, which is that kind of fulcrum in the angle where the, where the state cuts in, it kind of, it, it doesn't wrap around. And so it kind of jets off, you know, keeps going down south. And so as a result, uh, you have this relaxation of upwelling that you can see where it's kind of less red here. Um, and as a result, anyone who's ever been to Southern California can tell you that the water is warm and nice. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we have these really kind of distinct assemblages that we see north and south of Point Conception. Uh, and part of that is also driven by just an evolutionary lineage. Um, and so this is kind of a really well-studied faunal break that we know of in California. Um, so now I want to shift and talk a little bit about uh, sandy beaches. So, you know, we're in Monterey Bay, and so we think of Rocky Coast and intertidal zonation patterns, but sandy beaches really dominate uh, a lot of the coast in temperate and tropical coastlines. And so, for example, in this map, um, you can see that California falls uh, in the U.S., which is covered by 33% of sandy beach coastline. And we are actually within a range of 20 to 40 degrees latitude where sandy beaches are, um, the, the highest proportion of them exists. Uh, and so, you know, most of the world's major cities are, are kind of built on these coastlines. And as a result, beaches are experiencing a lot of uh, human-driven or anthropogenic stress. Uh, but they're also very dynamic environments, right? They're changing a lot in space and time just from natural processes. And so we're talking about an area that's just extremely uh, high energy prone to disturbance. And so we characterize beaches generally by the interplay between wave energy, wind energy, and, and sediment. And so this is kind of just a visual way to parse beaches out along this gradient of reflective to dissipative. And uh, I provided some examples of kind of more local examples of these. And so this is actually Monastery Beach. And anyone who has dove there will tell you how steep a slope it is and how demeaning and inhumane it is to try to like drag yourself up it at the end of a dive. <laughs> And you know, you're getting trashed in this zone here and there's all these giant grains of sand in your regulator and it's the worst. Um, but Monastery is a really good example of like a reflective beach profile versus if you think of like a sandals commercial, uh, you know, is, is more of a dissipative where the, the sand is much finer and it's kind of a low sloping beach. The waves are breaking farther offshore. Um, and you can see when you look at these pictures, like there's not a lot of, there's not a lot going on life-wise other than some people there. but. Uh, and so until the 1930s, beaches were thought to be kind of marine deserts, but actually <laughs> uh, they, are, they are populated by this extremely diverse group of organisms um, called the myofauna. And so, you know, this is, a, this is kind of a, a strict scientific definition, but really what you're talking about are, are organisms that are living in the interstitial in between space, uh, between grains of sand. And this is reflected in the etymology of the name, right? So myofauna, little life. Uh, and so, you know, this size range, you'll see it vary in the literature, but I'm going to stick with the 63 uh, microns to about a millimeter. So for the bigger ones, maybe you can see them with the naked eye if you're really looking, but for the most part, you're going to need a microscope. Um, but when you get down to that scale, they are extremely abundant. So, you know, there's this uh, statistic that under a footprint, you can have up to 100,000 individuals, right? And that's like tens of thousands in a handful of sand, which is insane. And, um, they're extremely, extremely diverse. And again, you'll see some, some variation on this stat, but uh, you know, they include representatives of up to 22 or 23 of the living phyla of animals. So it's like, that's insane. Uh, and so as you're gonna see, I use molecular techniques, so I don't actually have very many pictures of myofauna to show you because I don't have to look at them. Uh, so I pulled this video off of YouTube to kind of give you a sense of what they're gonna look like. Um, and so nematode, worms, something like that, and copepods, which are an arthropod you know, crustacean, are going to be very common representatives, as are um, flatworms. And this little dude is, a, I think, an ostracod, which is another type of uh, arthropod. Uh, and then we can see we've got a little gastropod mollusk there. And uh, I really want to know what this one guy that comes in at the end is in the top left. You'll see him zoom in there. Um, and so, so that guy. <laughs> and so. Myofauna can be either uh, permanent or transitional, right? So either they are, they are permanently living in this myofauna size class or they are uh, evolve or developing out of it, right? And so really only five classes or phyla are known, sorry, phyla are known to be purely myofaunal. Um, but they're quite important because many species go through an obligate myofauna feeding phase where they're providing, basically you can think of them as plankton of the sandy beach. That's a, scientifically a bad analogy, but you can think of them as being, you know, the base of the food web. And, and 
they're providing a lot of additional services regarding aeration of the sediment, um, you know, mineral turnover and, uh, you know, organic material turnover, things like that. Um, and I just want to touch really briefly, I almost cut this, but I think it's important. Uh, the difference between myofauna and macrofauna, macrofauna being the size class that's just kind of one, one up. Uh, and the reason why I think it's important is that uh, there's this pervasive theme in the literature where, you know, theories that are applied to myofauna were designed on research that was based on macrofauna. Uh, so, for example, you have this uh, swash exclusion hypothesis and the habitat harshness hypothesis that's saying that uh, richness should increase along that beach profile, in particular with the, respect to these three groups. Um, and these are groups that are represented in both, of, you know, macro and myofauna, but you know, they're often at odds with each other, either through competition for food or, or through direct predation. So I, I have to wonder at the, you know, how wise it is to apply them. Um, but the reason why that has been done is just that they're more tractable to work with. Myofauna are small and they're hard to pull out of the sediment and they're weird and people spend their whole lives learning about one group. And so I love this quote that says that, you know, the effort required to assign 10% of just this one little group of nematodes is 120 times the effort to assign all the vertebrate species in a rainforest. And, you know, nematodes are, are well studied because they're important in agriculture. So you're talking about like the best case scenario. Um, but, you know, so if they're so hard to work with, why, why do we even care? Um, well, they're relatively easily sampled. You know, I kind of just went out to a beach and like took plugs of sand. Uh, and the cost of analyzing them is decreasing all the time. So, you know, when we sequenced the human genome in 2001, it was $3 billion. And, and now we're working with these really large data sets as, as master's projects. Uh, so I think that the opportunities to working with them are opening up. Um, and they've also been implicated uh, in multiple systems. So we're talking about sandy beaches, but this is a, from a meta-analysis of all the studies last year that have been done on them. And like, they're all over the place. They're in many different systems. And you know, it's often hard to find things that tie these systems together. Uh, and lastly, they're, uh, they're really well suited to kind of be bioindicators of general ecosystem health. Um, and so this is from another meta-analysis, you know, where they kind of looked at the change in the pristine community to these more tolerant species as a result of disturbance. Um, and so I think this is kind of, you know, a really big application. Um, but this, I know this is a long quote, but like this gets at it, and this is kind of what John was saying, like this is why I wanted to work on them. Uh, Nathaniel Cobb was a, a nematologist, and he had this crazy quote that basically if you just took everything away, like all the forests and the oceans and you know, the rivers, there would just be like a film of nematodes, which is super alarming. But, um, you know, just really gets at this idea that this is a very ubiquitous group of things that we can be applying, like, a lot of applications, right? So, um, for my thesis, the objectives were, uh, first and foremost, just to establish a baseline of, of what myofauna communities are like in California, um, because having that baseline is often the first step to some of these next processes. Uh, you know, kind of get at that idea of pre-existing patterns from, for macrofauna are truly representative of, of myofauna. Um, provide some evidence for some important environmental drivers. Uh, we got a fancy new mineral machine, and Ivano and I were talking about fun things to do with it, and so we applied some of it to this, this project, which I'll talk about. Um, and one of the issues with the molecular work is that many of the databases are myofauna poor with regards to myofauna sequences, so I can kind of in turn take the results of this and, and put them into the databases. Um, but with respect to specific hypotheses, uh, so, you know, I would talk about that latitudinal diversity gradient, and given that, you know, it, it seems to be fairly general and there are some groups represented in myofauna that have been shown to abide by it, you know, what is the generality of it with respect to myofauna? So, you know, theoretically we might see significant differences in community composition from, from south to north or north to south. Um, we have the data to answer this point conception question or get at this point conception question because we have sites north and south. So can we pick up that signal where we're seeing really distinct assemblages north and south of point conception? And, you know, uh, myofauna are known to have limited dispersal, so why not, you know? Um, and then does myofauna community composition change with respect to tidal height? So kind of moving from a scale of very broad down, down to the more finite, um, there is some evidence in the literature for this, but you can imagine that things that are living lower in the tidal range um, are, are uh, subjected to different pressures than things that are living higher up. 
Uh, and lastly, how does myofauna, myofaunal communities kind of change as a function of, of some of these sedimentary characteristics? So I was moonlighting as a geologist for a time here. Um, I have these as placeholders. Enjoy them. They're very white. <laughs> so I'm using this infographic to kind of walk you through the process by which I, uh, I did this. And so this whole, this whole technique is called meta barcoding, and it really draws on this idea that our DNA is like a barcode or you know, a fingerprint that when scanned can tell you something about um, this kind of mixed sample you know, when you're targeting a very specific region, sequencing it, and then applying these diversity analyses to it. So I'm going to start by talking about my field sampling. Um, enjoy this scenic video of me at Monastery. Um, so. <laughs> In the summer of 2017, <laughs> yeah, uh, in the summer of 2017, I lived in my car. I only got the cops called on me once. It was great. Um, and so I sampled at these 10 sites, and you know, I was trying to kind of get an even spread between northern, central, and southern California. And uh, so this is up near Trinidad. This is Fort Bragg, uh, Bodega Bay, Año Monastery. Uh, this is down near Cambria, and then. Uh, near LA, Newport Beach, San Diego, and, and um, La Jolla. Um, and so my intent was to kind of get some representatives of that reflective dissipative gradient um, in, in all these areas. And it turns out that this can actually be quite difficult to do, but that was what I was intending. Um, and so at each beach, I would take a weighted meter tape, and, and I would go at low tide, and I would walk out to the toe, which is kind of that point where the, the sand slopes down. You know, you're always kind of like doing this. Um, and so I would put my meter tape that, starting there, and I would take plugs of sediment every 10 meters and uh, up to basically the, either the berm or, or like the, the high tide line. And uh, you know, these are, you know, because each beach is different, I can't explicitly say that all of these are comparable, but I just wanted to get at this idea of roughly a low, medium, or high tide. Uh, and so this is kind of what it looks like. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, and then I would, sorry, uh, so myofauna tend to concentrate in the top 2 to 12-ish centimeters of sediment, so you really don't even have to go very deep to get most of the abundance. Uh, and so then you put them in preservative and, and you bring them back. Um, and so now we're going to move into how, you know, how do you get that information out of them. Well, uh, essentially you have, you know, kind of this squiggly tube of, of DNA and you, and you want to target a very specific area of it. And so we use this kit where you essentially put a, a chemical into the tubes that breaks apart all the cells so that you end up with this kind of slurry of DNA um, that you can then extract. Um, and so we, we do a PCR which makes kind of exponentially more copies of the things that we're targeting and then uh, after you purify it and standardize it, you can, you can sequence, and sequence it through a, uh, in this case it was a MySeq sequencer. Uh, and I'm going to introduce some very important terms here that are going to be very important going forward. So when we talk about reads, um, raw reads are the things that come out of the sequencer. And so there's two raw reads for every sequence that we're going to try to ID. So you have to, you have to merge them, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but after that, when we talk about reads, we're talking about something that is essentially functionally analogous to an individual uh, versus an operational taxonomic unit or an OTU you can think of as being a species. And the reason that we call them this is because we can't always find reference sequences in the database to say this is what it is, but we're fairly certain that it's, it's a species, right? And so a lot of times in this, I'm, I'm going to be talking about richness and diversity with respect to OTUs. Um, and so I want to talk real quick about the gene I selected. So we're dealing with a lot of taxonomic diversity, right? We have all of these representative groups, and, and we need to be able to target an area that is found in all of them. So, you need, so essentially what you need is uh, a part of the genome that is important enough to very basic life that everything will have it. So it's well conserved across a lot of these groups, but it needs to have enough specificity that you can tell things apart. Um, and so we used 18S. Uh, which is one of the more frequently used genes for biodiversity screening. And um, you can see this is kind of a little map of, of that gene area. And it's, it's involved in protein synthesis, so it's, it's very conserved. Um, and then, you know, you can target specific areas in 18S um, by, by selecting primers or your DNA sequences that are going to kind of lock on to the areas around here. So for, 
for this study, we targeted the V1, V2 region using this primer set that was designed on nematodes, and it produces a fragment about 300, 400 base pairs. Um, and unfortunately, because it is so conserved, what that means is that you generally can't get down to a species level identification using this gene because there's not enough differentiation versus some of these other genes. So for the most part, I'm gonna be talking about phylum level. Uh, and, you know, depending on your question, you might choose to do it differently. Um, so uh, when you feed them through the bioinformatical pipeline, the first thing you have to do is you have to merge your, right, your two raw reads. So you've got an R1 and you've got an R2 and you merge them, and so this kind of part in the overlap, that's your sequence that you're gonna try to ID. Um, and so you feed it through a, a quality filtering process where you um, tell it how much error you're willing to account for, and it'll, it'll parse out sequences that don't meet that error criteria, right? And then um, you go on to a stage called dereplication, which is a fancy word for saying, you go through all your se uh, sequences and you pull out a unique example of each one. So a lot of them are gonna be 100% similar because you can have you know, multiple reads to an OTU, uh, but it makes the next step just computationally easier to just work with one example of each thing. Um, and so we go through this step called clustering, and this is really how we determine how many species we're gonna see or OTUs we're gonna see. And so the idea is that you, know, you, you parse things into little bins or clusters that are X percent similar to one another. And so in our case, we start by parsing at 99%, and then we take those and we parse them again at 97. So perhaps, you know, this red and blue cluster are 97% similar. They might borg into a purple cluster. Um, and so, you know, from that you create an OTU table, which is essentially analogous to any other type of diversity table you might see from any field sampling. You know, this is just my samples, my species, and counts. Like it's, and so from that you can do all your standard analyses that you would do. Um, and so for, for the grain size stuff, uh, I went really ghetto for it first and <laughs> hand sieved 148 samples through this many sieves and uh, recorded the proportion of, of each class. And uh, I fed it into this program, an Excel program that spits out all this information for every sample. Um, and essentially what we're gonna focus on is the mean grain size, um, the mode, the sorting, which is the standard deviation, and then some of these kind of descriptors, like it's sand or, you know, it's not sand. Um, and, and modality here is just kind of how many, um, how many bell, bell shapes you have. Uh, and then with our fancy new machine, um, it's called an x-ray powder diffraction machine, and it essentially tells you the mineral composition of your sediments. And uh, in the sake of time, I'm not going to go into it, but I had uh, one sample for each site that I kind of pulled some sand from every tidal level and, and ground it up. Uh, and you get these, these peaks, these intensity peaks, and so you know, these are, are standardized in the literature, and so you can identify minerals in that way. You can go back and compare them to a database. Uh, and so that's, that's how I got my mineral data, which ends up being just percentages. Um, and then for my oceanographic data, I pulled, um, buoyed or uh, shore station data from SKUs and SENKUs, which are just a, a network of, of buoy data. And except for uh, Ana Nuevo didn't have one, so uh, Ambari kindly, kindly gave me some data. Uh, and I used a 30-day uh, range around my sampling dates to calculate these three, um, these three conditions. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> let's get into it. Uh, so this is, this is raw reads. This is what's coming off the sequencer. So ultimately I had 125 million raw reads, which again, there's, there's two, right, to each sequence. So that's about 62, that's weird, I don't know what that is. Uh, there's about 62 million pairs, right? And so we go through that process of merging them and we were able to merge about 71%. And then uh, of that, about 83% pass our quality control. And so we have an average sequence length of about 363 base pairs, which is what we were expecting. Um, and after our clustering steps, we generated you know, just under 8,000 OTUs across all our samples, um, which these are always gonna move from north to south, but you can kind of see the breakdown here. But you can also see that you know, the total reads is not even across samples, and so we have to perform what's called a rarefaction. Uh, and it's essentially a tool to calculate richness through this idea of repeated sampling. So if you went out to sample a pond every day for a week, you know, the, the order in which you pull things out would be different, you know, each, each time that you do it. And so you generate these kind of 
curves where, you know, as you pull more and more things out, there's, it's less likely that they're going to be a new species. You're just kind of pulling the same things out. And so if you, if you look at this little orange one, for example, um, you can look and see that, you know, if you move this way, you're going to get more reeds, but you're not really getting a lot more species richness, you know, versus if you move down, you might get, you know, more reeds, but you're not going to, you're basically optimizing this trade-off between uh, the samples that you retain and the diversity that you retain. And so it just in my case, uh, we ended up uh, rarefying to, you know, 78,434. And as you can see, we don't lose a lot of diversity after that. This is 0 0.0001 difference. Um, so this is our rarefied summary stats for all of our OTUs, all 7,800. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have the total OTUs, we have the unique to each site OTUs, and we have the ones that are shared across all. Um, whoa, sorry. And this is where we're going to kind of get into how you actually go about identifying things. So you take all your OTUs and you feed them into a database that is full of reference sequences. And theoretically, there's a reference sequence in there that matches each one of your things, right? And so when we did that, we got a blast hit, which is just the, the process of doing that uh, for all but six, which is great. Um, but you know, not all of those are as solid an ID as others. And so you have a criterion that you ask where you need your reference sequence and the thing you're trying to ID to 90% overlap at least. And of that 90% overlap, you want them to be 97% similar. So when we look at that, we, we kind of drop down to about 2,100. And of those, we were able to assign 604 to something, and of those, 266 were myofauna. So you can see, this is where I was getting at, where myofauna are really poorly represented in the database. Um, but I looked into it, um, and while the number of OTUs is maybe a little bit lower compared to some other studies in the literature, we retained quite a bit of the diversity that we expected to see. So this is a breakdown of, of the myofauna. Um, and as you can see, it's primarily dominated by uh, annelids and nematodes and, and flatworms, which is pretty consistent with other studies. Um, flatworms are actually kind of a neat byproduct of molecular methods where they were getting so damaged in traditional taxonomy IDs that it wasn't thought that they were a big part of myofauna until you started doing it molecularly. Um, some of these other guys, honestly, it's a lot of things that look like worms. <laughs> uh, so we have nemertians, which are on my cake, um, <laughs> mollusks, gastrotrix, which are one of those myofauna fauna, uh, cnidarians, so like hydroids, um, a lot of copepods, that's another very common one. Um, and this other one is, is tardigrades, which people love, and um, some bryzoans, and just things that were present in, in fairly low abundance. Um, and I just want to highlight that even though our OTU count was perhaps a bit low, uh, we actually captured quite a bit of of the diversity that we expected to see. So all of these are accounted for uh, in this group. And while our total OTUs and uniques dropped off with the myofauna, the patterns inherent in them are consistent with the greater pool. So I will reference kind of either the greater pool or the myofauna pool, but I'll, I'll try to be explicit about which is which. Um, but let's start by just kind of looking at, again, a north to south bar chart of, of the broader group. So our, our myofauna is in dark green, but uh, we actually picked up a lot of other things, a lot of uh, bacteria, uh, some, some microalgae, uh, other metazoas like vertebrates and uh, like terrestrial things, a lot of spiders, uh, fungus, right? And, and then this is the number of OTUs plotted out just to see. And you can see it'll be a reoccurring theme that monastery is kind of weird. Um, but yeah, so now we're going to move and look into just the myofauna. So this is that dark green bar. Um, and as you can see, you know, this is at the phylum level, but there are, you know, there, there's some distinction between sites. And again, we're looking at this latitudinal diversity gradient, uh, which would suggest that we should see greater diversity moving along here. Um, and with regards to OTU richness, so the number of OTU richness, you know, it's, it's lowest here at the most northern site, and it kind of increases, but it's, it's not a strict latitudinal diversity gradient, but it, the latitudinal diversity gradient is, is premised on the species level, and we're working with higher orders. So the fact that the patterns are not quite so distinct is perhaps not unexpected. Um, so if you look at all of your OTUs, 
uh, identified or not, just our total pool versus our myofauna OTUs, just in terms of richness, you know, I put these trend lines on here not to necessarily tell you anything statistical, but just to show you the trend. And there is kind of that, that diversity gradient, but if you look at um, the diversity index for some of these, there's this, you know, Central California tends to parse out as being quite diverse, and I think that maybe this is because Central California falls within this really broad transition zone between those two evolutionary lineages I showed in the intro that those kind of two distinct communities of the um, north and south of Point Conception. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a lot of these plots, and this is a really like easy one to interpret, so I'm going to walk you through it slow. But uh, this is called an NMDS, a non-parametric multidimensional scaling plot. And all you need to know is that sites that are closer together, points that are closer together, are more similar to one another than points that are farther away. Uh, so right now I have it parsed out by, by domain. Um, and if you run a test, a statistical test on this, a permanova, uh, you will find that the domains are significant from one another. They're distinct from one another. Um, and these don't tell you anything statistic, uh, statistically meaningful. They're just visual representations of data. So you still have to apply these tests to them. But we can see that the, you know, if we're looking at just north and south, they are the, the least similar to one another, right? So more evidence for this gradient. And so now I'm recoloring them by site. Um, and again, if you run that same test, each site is going to be significantly different, right? So sites within the same domain are more likely to be similar to one another than ones farther away, but they are each distinct. Um, and so again, myofauna, or sorry, monastery, not sure what it's doing. Um, so I'm going to pull it out just because it, it messes everything up. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is just to show you that these sites really tend to cluster out. Um, and so I wanted to look at, you know, what might be driving what you're seeing. So I pulled that, that buoy data, or that shore station data, and these are correlational analyses between these different uh, variables and the richness associated with them. And so you can see that, you know, for a lot of these you have a decent decent uh, relationship between them. Uh, and this is, I know it's a bit of a wonky graph because the units are different, but the intent was just to compare, you know, the same color across to show you how these sites kind of broke down environmentally. Um, and I'm going to have to exclude Fort Bragg going forward because unfortunately I could only find temperature data for it, so I can't talk about salinity and chlorophyll for it. Um, but this is Again, another one of these visual tables, and it's, it's a little bit different. It's called a principal components analysis, but the, uh, the way that you read them is the same. And uh, I've overlaid these environmental factors across our sites to show you how sites are parsing out with regards to environment. Uh, and essentially, you can kind of draw axes through these um, and think of them as just a standard graph, right? So for example, with us, with salinity, is that say salinity? Yeah. Um, you know, these sites have higher salinity and this site over here has, has lower salinity. So it's, you know, it's taking all this data and condensing it down into this kind of two-dimensional distance plot. So again, this doesn't tell us anything about what's driving it, it just shows us that something exists. So uh, I used a, a program called Primer uh, and I did this, this series of steps for a lot, so I'm going to walk you through this one a bit slower. Um, so the first thing I did is this test called Relate and it tells you if there's a relationship between your environmental data and your biological data. Um, and basically these little, the, the distances on the, between these points are, are inherently built into a matrix, right? So you just have a table that compares all the points to each other and it, it calculates these distances. Um, and so what this figure is showing you is, you know, 54% of your biological variation is explained by environmental variation. And, this is that 54%, and it, this is basically what happens when you randomly sample from those two tables. And what it says is that there is a pattern inherent in it that is broken when you randomize everything. Um, so, but this doesn't tell us, you know, what's driving it. It just says that something's there. So you do this best test, which is similar to the relate, but instead of a, uh, comparing two matrices, you're comparing just data onto a matrix. Um, and so when you do that, you find that temperature and salinity are, uh, are the two things that are, are driving this the most. Um, but again, it doesn't tell you how, you know, like what is the breakdown of this 54%. It just tells you which variables are more important. So from there, you do this distance-based linear model that, that tells you, um, you know, how does this break down. Uh, and so 
if you're familiar, this is similar to a linear regression. So it's, it's telling you if each factor is significant on its own and then what happens when you combine them all into a model. And so what we found was that temperature was the biggest predictor and salinity was almost significant. The, the threshold is 0.05. Uh, and chlorophyll really didn't seem, seem to have any effect. Um, and our final model using all these variable accounts for basically 44% of the variation that we're seeing. Um, so this site here had weirdly low salinity relative to the rest, and, and this guy here had um, anomalously high chlorophyll. And I can't weigh out that something weird hadn't happened where my, where my buoys were. You know, maybe it rained a lot, you know, in the time that I was sampling there. And so just, just to kind of really show how that pattern works out, I, just, I pulled them out. And you can see that you, you have this really strong gradient between warm southern sites and, and cold northern sites. Um, and you can see that temperature is really driving a lot of that first like, component. Um, so, oh, and if you remake the model, the kind of variation you can explain goes up. Uh, so uh, assignable myofauna display a rough adherence to this latitudinal diversity gradient you know, with regards to number of OTs, but diversity doesn't tend to trend as much. However, and each site are, are different from one another, so you really have to think of them as individual sites. Um, and latitude in the context of environmental conditions, it seems that temperature is, uh, is pretty descriptive. And salinity was more important than I, I expected, and I was looking into this over the last few days, and it sounds like the, the range of salinity can be important more than the actual absolute value itself, and so I, that's something that I want to go back and look at, but uh, that might explain it. Uh, and then again, just, you know, some of the trends weren't as clear cut as I wanted, but that might be accounted for the fact that we're not looking at species level, we're looking at phylum level. Um, so moving on to our point conception question. I'm so excited about this. This is the thing I'm most excited about. <laughs> um, so I asked this question because I thought we had the data to answer it, but if I was designing an experiment to talk about point conception, I would have designed it differently. Uh, but interestingly, we found three times as many OTUs that exist only north of point conception. And if you look at just the myofauna OTUs, it's, it's four times as many. And, you know, there's more sites north of point conception than south, but like, this is, this to me seems, seems striking. And so I made this figure, and these are essentially telling you the same thing. But, um, for example, if you're standing at our northernmost site, at that point, 100% of your OTUs are only found to the south of you because we haven't sampled north, right? But as you move south and you stand on each of these beaches, the proportion of OTUs that are only found south of you gets higher and the percent that are only found north of you, right, it, it kind of has an inverse relationship and that's what you're seeing here. And what this is saying is that the point at which the biggest differences in communities exists on either side of you is falling out kind of right here. And it's kind of putting it roughly in Big Sur. It's not point conception, but it's geographically really close. Um, and I'm not sure what the California Current is doing really locally in that area, but I, to me, this says that that point conception thing is true, which is exciting to me. <laughs> and if you look back at our bar chart, like this is where point conception is, and you can see there is, like if you look at the sites on just either side, they are quite distinct. Um, and also, interestingly, uh, this is San Francisco Bay, which is another kind of lesser known faunal break, but again, the sites on either side of it are quite distinct. So I do think we're picking up this signal to an extent, um, right? So, exciting. <laughs> um, all right, so this inflection point, is basically when, when there's an equal number of north-south OTUs, you know, existing on either side of you. Um, and it is in the vicinity of point conception. Um, and there do seem to be some kind of shifts in, in the phylum level communities when you're looking at just on either side of that place. Um, all right, so tidal height. I thought that this was gonna be a simple question, but it turns out beaches are not all the same. So that's what it looks like when you plot it out. And the reason that these are all weird is because uh, I had to change all the tidal heights to percentages to be able to compare them because the beaches were not the same height. Um, so the tidal height term is significantly different and the, the tidal height by site term is two, which means that at each beach, the tidal height effect is different. So we really have to break it down uh, to look at it. And instead of showing you like 20 plots, um, I just decided to run those, those statistical tests to see if 
tide height was significant. And it is in all of them except for uh, Wind and Sea in La Jolla and uh, Fort Bragg here. So those are both numbers that are above 0.05. Uh, and so, again, instead of running through this, I'm just going to pick one that is significantly different and one that is not and run you through how I would analyze them. Um, and it's worth noting that, you know, these are really variable habitats and this is a snapshot in time. So if I went back and sampled them again, it, it might look different from this. You know, they might all be significant. But um, so here's, here's tidal height breakdown on those plots. And, you know, you, I, I did it rainbow you pride. Uh, but you can see, like, the lower tidal ones tend to cluster out separately from the, from the mid and, and the high. And here they really don't. It's kind of all muddled together. Um, and this is reflected in the similarities between tidal heights. Um, so I've, I've put an asterisk near the ones that are significantly different. And there are some of them here and, and none of them here. So things are just not parsing out. Um, and if you look at the charts, you know, to be honest, it's not as obvious as I was hoping, but again, I think that this is that database representation issue and looking at these kind of higher taxonomic levels. You know, there's a couple uh, groups that were present, you know, here that weren't present there. And, and maybe you could argue that the, the way that these get higher and lower is more extreme, but um, we can do what's called a, a simper analysis. Uh, and we can do different things with it, but it essentially tells you which species are driving the change that you're seeing. So for example, we know Agate Beach is significantly different, so we can look at these ones that are different and say, what's, what's the one thing that's really getting, or five things, you know? And so for this, uh, you know, it was a gastro trick here, and the asterisk means that it's the same thing. It was the same OTU. Um, and so you can see they're kind of parsed out a, a, across the different groups. Um, some people have said that it, it tends to be driven more by nematodes and copepods, but um, I think they were probably focusing more on those groups with their primers, so really targeting those things more. Um, and at Fort Bragg, we know that they're not similar. So we can say, you know, what is the things that are present there that are accounting for the fact that they're all the same, and it's, it's these groups. And then we can compare them and say, you know, what are the things that are accounting for the dissimilarity between these sites? And, you know, we can account for up to 50% by looking at, at these particular species. These are the things that are present that are making them different. Um, so myofauna, I think they do form distinct communities, but it's, it's really locally driven. So you really have to kind of get into the nitty gritty of the space that you're at. Um, dissimilarities seem to be driven kind of more by the, the annelid arthropod flatworm, which is, is more what's been supported in the literature, um, while kind of things that you see everywhere tend to uh, be spread across the different phyla. Um, so due to the fact that uh, myofauna is patchy, and this is just a snapshot. Again, I think if you go back and sample again, you might get different results. Um, and again, some of the variation may be, again, we just don't have a full selection of everything that's there. Um, and so lastly, oh man, my slide didn't do it. Uh, okay, lastly, we're gonna look at the sediment characteristics. So this is a breakdown of how all the sites fall out on this kind of sand, gravel, mud continuum. And like, oh shoot, big surprise, it's mostly sand. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we're on beaches. Uh, so, like, sandy gravel, for example, is, is mostly myofauna. So the, gra or, oh my God, I always use monastery. So the grain sizes tend to be much bigger, but it's all just this percentage of, of gravel to sand that's dictating these categories. Um, and so, again, these are similar to before, just how richness uh, plays out as a function of these different parameters. And you can see compared to like the temperature, you know, salinity data, the correlations are much lower. So uh, richness is, is less well explained by, by these uh, variables. But we're gonna do that same kind of series of tests that we did before and we're gonna look at it anyway. Um, so this is, this is what the NMDS plot, or sorry, the PCA plot looks like for sediment, um, like grain size analysis, right? So just the grain size. Um, and it's, it's kind of messy, but there's kind of this general axis where uh, mean grain size and skewness, which is how symmetrical the distribution is, shows that as being important. Um, and so I ran these same three tests for all of the OTUs, regardless of if we'd ID'd them, and then just the myofauna. Um, and there's this trend where uh, the actual, the, the broad group of OTUs better relates to these parameters than myofauna do on their own. So 
you know, 50% of the variability in the biology is explained by these sediment parameters for everything, but in myofauna, it's just 21%. Um, and in both cases, that kind of mean grain size is, is the thing that's driving it, which is what I would expect, right? You know, they're living in the spaces between grains of sand, so how big the sand is is, is going to matter. Um, and if you run those distance-based linear models, uh, it does include all of these parameters, but you end up being able to explain about 18 and 15 percent, which is pretty low. So, you know, that says that a lot of this variability we just can't account for with, with this model, but, um, you know, still something to go off of. Um, and so looking at mineral composition, this is the breakdown of, of the mineral composition, and we picked kind of the, the top three highest percentages. Um, for example, one of the other things is uh, McCarriture had a lot of calcite, which is something that you would find in shells. And at first I was worried that I had accidentally ground up a shell that I didn't see, and that's what was causing that. But I was looking at the sand at my desk yesterday, and I actually think that, that is, that's real. Like I think that that is not an artifact of me messing up. I think that's actually how it looks. Um, and so when you do your PCAs, uh, this is kind of how it parses out. Uh, and again, you know, Fort Bragg is really kind of off to the side because of that high percentage of calcite. Um, and so this is what it looks like by domain. And you can kind of see that based on, on where you are in California, some of these minerals uh, are more or less important. Uh, and I pulled out Fort Bragg just to see if it changed that relationship. And you could see some of these axes kind of tighten up and the plagioclase becomes, uh, becomes important. But I think this K Feldspar is, is the biggest contributor based on the models, um, which it, potassium feldspar is the greatest uh, mineral in, in, in continental crust, so in, in terrestrial based rock. Um, and so I did, again, the same, same test with these same two groups. Uh, and actually, these turned out to be very similar uh, percentages to the sediment stuff. Um, and again, we have that trend where all the OTUs better fit with this mineral data than, than the myofauna do, and it tends to be this potassium feldspar that is most important. Um, and we can explain 16% and 13% of our variation. And so, you know, this isn't a lot, but best as I can tell, no one's looked at this before. So this is kind of exciting in the sense that this is the first study that I can find to correlate this type of data with biological communities. Um, so in conclusion, you know, oceanographic variables had stronger correlations than, than maybe some of these sedimentary ones. Um, and the greater OTU pool was really a better fit for these models. And I, I think about why that is. And, you know, I think, I, you know, myofauna are really closely allied with the sediment. But what's more closely allied with the sediment than, like, bacteria that is coating grains of sediment? So I, I think that maybe that's why that is. Um, mean grain size was the most predictive variable. Um, and K feldspar was, was the most predictive mineralogical variable. Um, it's not a nudibranch, but. Uh, so in conclusion, you know, do we see a change with the latitudinal diversity gradient? Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's a little, it's a little loose because of the taxonomic resolution that we have. But um, do myofauna show patterns with the faunal break? Yeah, so exciting. <laughs> um, do they, they change with respect to tidal height? Uh, yes, but it, it's, it's variable in space and time, I guess, as we could have anticipated. Um, and, you know, are they changing as a function of kind of some of these sediment characteristics? Yes, but it's really preliminary. I would be interested, you know, I'm still digging into this data because I'm not a geologist, so it, it takes me a little bit longer to, to process it. Um, and then, this is a takeaway of my thesis. <laughs> um, so. You know, we talked a lot about diversity, but, you know, I talked about the ways that it parses out, but we haven't talked a lot about different levels of looking at diversity. So, for example, if each of these is a beach, the diversity associated with that beach is known as, as alpha diversity. So every beach has its own diversity metric. Um, and, you know, you can look at diversity across all of your sites, which we kind of did. We looked at, you know, total OTs and things like that, and that's called gamma diversity. Um, but there's this kind of less easy to understand concept of beta diversity, which is the differences in diversity between two sites. Um, and I thought that this was going to be the most important thing. But by nature of the fact that every beach is unique, that what that really says is that the alpha diversity is the, is the most important thing to, to look at, at least for myofauna in this study. Um, for example, if there was a high level of, of unique OTUs at each place, then maybe this beta diversity 
would become more important because you have kind of um, things that are associating with one place and not another. Um, and so I lie awake at night now <laughs> thinking about this question because it came up again and again. It's like, what the hell is happening there? And so apologies to Esner people, but I would posit that, in fact, the cosmic center of the universe is not in Elkhorn Slough, but is, in fact, a monastery. Um, <laughs> if you're not from here, that joke won't be funny. Uh, but, you know, like, what is setting it apart, right? So it has this mean grain size that's it's over two millimeters. Like, that's, that's big sand, right? And it's this sandy gravel. It's, it's, pre, it's not as well sorted as some of the other sites because there's so much wave energy throwing things around. And uh, it, it's immature, which means it has a lower percentage of quartz um, because essentially that sand has not been sitting there long enough for everything else to weather away. Um, and I was talking to Ivano, who was pointing out that the sediment is likely being derived from the submarine canyon that we have here and not from the watershed, which makes it unique. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's truly a reflective beach. And I, I think that this kind of harsh environment is, is driving more of this specialization. This was the site that had the most unique OTUs, but it had relatively fewer OTUs overall. So we're talking about this environment that's like driving specialization. And I have so many questions about it that I still need to address. But um, I think, you know, like, what does an outlier really tell us? Well, if every beach is different, then I think these outliers are a really good exploratory space. And I don't mean go to monastery and learn things and apply them to every other space, because clearly that would be not smart. But I think I've been, I've been feeling more and more that what we truly need is, is a, instead of a broad sweep study like what I've just done, is like a fine tooth comb study where we go to one or two of these beaches and we sample them really consistently over greater area over time. You know, what happens before and after a storm? Like, what happens? I have no idea. Um, and I think the drivers here are, are different than some of the other ones that we've seen. So I think you can find places where the sediment's going to override the oceanography of, of, in importance, you know, and what dictates that inflection point? Like, what, what about a, a space tells you what you need to focus on? And, and I also think that outliers like this, you know, those are good places to go hunting for rare things if that's what you're interested in. Um, so I'm really interested in, in getting into that. Um, and I also wanted to touch on this idea of, you know, I looked at three environmental parameters and like sediment, grain, and minerals. It's, you know, like you can look at a lot more. And so the reason that I thought that that was enough was because you can infer a lot from some of these things just by knowing. So for example, you know, mineralogy tells you a lot about the microenvironment with respect to some of these other um, impacts that are very important to myofauna. So, you know, pore space, they're living in between, you know, grains of sand. Uh, drainage, you know, so how, how moist they're able to, to, main, to be. And surface area, you know, they're really kind of up in the, in the cracks in the sand. And, and the angularity and, and the oxygen content. And so these are kind of SEM images of those, those minerals. And this is one that is not very weathered versus one that is very weathered. And you know, some of these other minerals, once they weather, actually become much more pockmarked. And I think that it, you know, these, these types of things are actually going to drive some of this diversity because they just make better habitat. And so this is another thing. you know. I want to look into this going forward. I, I think I would like to look at some of my sediment under a, an SEM. Uh, and so going forward, again, I really think there's this need for, need for a long-term study um, with more comprehensive environmental characterization. Um, getting at this, you know, we've been talking about this database issue. And you know, we can generate a billion sequences, but if we can't relate them to anything, then it doesn't matter. And so. There's a different type of sequencing you can do where you basically like you pull a leg off a copepod and you're like, okay, I had somebody ID this. This is what it is. Now I'm going to sequence it. And so you're generating those references. And I and I think, you know, that this this interplay between these massive sequencing efforts and really like targeted sequencing efforts is what is going to reconcile a lot of this this lack of representation that we have, um, and also mixing primer pools. So a lot of people have started targeting nematodes separately from everything else because they're they tend not to behave in the same way that other myofauna do molecularly. So you can use different primers to pull out different things. Um, 
and then also some you know alternate gene sequencing. So this is something that we've we've done with my data where we we targeted CO1 instead of 18S uh, and. CO1 is less conserved, so there's more variation, so you can get down to species level. And, you know, for example, like my, uh, my tidal height test, it was a smaller subset, but it was very significant. Like, it was, it was a much cleaner result. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, a test we've done sampling CO1 on these different mixed sampling types that we have in our lab. Um, and then I have this theory about grain size that I left out for time, and I'm already way over, but ask me about it later. Um, <laughs> And, and then last, just, you know, clearing that myofauna gap. So, you know, as I said, we can seed the databases with some of these sequences. And, and there is actually a myofauna database for the UK that somebody made. And, uh, you know, we have, like, very poor representation here. So I really think it would be great if we had something like that for the states. Um, but I don't want to imply that there's no need, like, taxonomy is the past because a lot of the taxonomic resolutions and relationships in myofauna are really poorly understood and, and things are falling apart all the time. And uh, there's always going to be a need for, for like taxonomists. And so I went to this workshop uh, in Texas that was you know, bringing those people together, the molecular people and the, and the taxonomy people. And it was such a treat to learn from them. And you know, this is how reconciling those things is how we, we deal with that database paucity. Um, and also, you know, we're backing up some of those hypotheses. So, for example, you know, we come back to this um, increasing diversity across this, this beach type. Um, and, you know, if you look at annelids, it does kind of look like it's true. Um, I don't think we had enough mollusk representation to really get at it. But uh, for arthropods, too, you know, that one actually, I would say, let's see, what do I want to say? Like, okay, monastery is a very reflective beach. These groups are much less represented in here. This is all gastrotrix. And for example, uh, a really dissipative beach would be Torrey Pines. And we are seeing more proportions of those groups that we expect. So I actually think that in this case, it was, it was a hypothesis that worked. Um, but there are some other ones that I'm currently looking into. Um, and again, just reconciling this role of methods uh, is going to make answering these questions a lot easier. Um, and lastly, you know, coming back to these results and how we can apply them, um, you know, myofauna are a good indicator group for a lot of disturbance. Uh, they have high abundance. They're very ubiquitous. Uh, their generation time is quite rapid. Uh, and so they're a great tool to use to study these as we learn more about them. Uh, we can learn about cryptic species complexes. So, like, this is four different species of butterfly. Uh, and we only know that because we did the molecular work on them. So, you know, these tools, and especially I think there's, I think there's a lot of cryptic species in myofauna because they have limited dispersal, but they're also found everywhere. So is it really the same thing? Probably not. Um, they're very applicable to ecotones, right? So I did find terrestrial OTUs. I said I found a lot of bugs. Um, and I think you could use them to kind of look at these transitionary zones. Uh, I think that would be an interesting application. Bioprospecting. So, you know, they're using tardigrades to look for life-saving secrets. Um, so bioprospecting is basically pulling, um, you know, economically meaningful things out of the ocean, basically. And so we can look at these genes and how they're decelerating their biology. Um, and also, myofauna are a great gateway to STEM. Like, we can go out on the beach right now and, like, take some sand, and I can show you myofauna. Like, I think that they're a really nice way to get people invested in STEM. Uh, and having said that, I'm going to try not to cry. <laughs> um, so these two form the, the two halves to my heart. They're right there. Uh, and like, I think what draws them together is look at the cool places that we get to go. We weren't even dating when this was taken. Like, that is not staged. It's amazing. Um, and I just, I, I could not have done this without you guys, honestly. Um, and, and in addition, my other friends at Moss Landing, uh, we have gone to some amazing places. And I had this whole thing that I was going to tell Elizabeth that I orchestrated our friendship by like working in the same system as her in Baja. Like, I wanted to be her friend, but I couldn't tell her, so I just did a project in mangroves. So we were stuck <laughs> together, <laughs> and it totally worked. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, Moss Landing has been such a great community. And of course, uh, if you don't know, I have like six brothers and sisters, <laughs> and um, two of them are here. And my mom, and you know, I needed them so much, and I thank them so much for all the support.
Um, and of course, I would like to thank my committee. Uh, John has, has been great, and Ivano, and Pamela Branick, who I've actually never met. She's in Florida, but she's a myofauna lady, and I definitely would email her and be like, I don't know what's happening, please help. And she was very supportive. Um, the Invert Lab, especially Martin, I'm gonna not laser you. Uh, Martin has literally been my slave for the last three weeks. <laughs> Through sickness and health and working on the weekends and like, if you watch Parks and Rec, they make that joke about how, you know, if your husband leaves you, you'll recover, but if your babysitter leaves you, you will never recover. That is how I feel, like I needed my, <laughs> I needed my friends and my family, but I needed Martin more. <laughs> like, <laughs> Uh, but, but thank you to all of my lab mates because honestly, John was saying the other day, we have such a, a, a nice crew right now. Um, I didn't put Tracy on here, but in the beginning, you know, Tracy taught me a lot of what I knew. Um, all of my teachers that I've had at Moss Landing, you know, I've, it's taken me four years, but I've, I've been really thankful for the time that I've had. Um, the front office group, literally the only, like I would run in there with some emergency that was my own fault and they would fix it. Um, and like Michelle would just email me to tell me that she was proud of me. And I didn't know what to say in the moment, but like that meant a lot to me. Um, you know, and Tara, like what would we do without her? Uh, you know, the shop crew, I, I regret that I never got to take shop. Uh, Marine Ops, uh, JD like cradled me in his bare hands when I fainted uh, <laughs> very early on in my time here. Um, the IT in the library and uh, of course everybody at Moss Landing and then uh, my funding agencies. And with that, thank you. I went well. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Oh my God, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, All right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, You're on. Uh, so I know sometimes in lab we find things that we sequence and we're like, what is that, like brain eating mold? I found a mango. I don't think, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any yeah. like weird sequences uh, you were like, I don't think there was a hummingbird in my sequence. I found a mango. Um, <laughs> a long time ago when I was working on the sponges, I, like I, at the time it seemed really funny, but it was like, a, a bear that has been extinct for 10,000 years, but it's just that like the DNA sequence was so like conserved. But uh, you know, to be honest, we were we had to do them all by hand because we couldn't get the chime pipeline to work. So I I didn't have time to like dwell over the fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you found a mango. The sequence you, came back. Well, you found a sequence that resembled. The yes. Mango. Yes. Exactly. That percent. Yeah, but like. What? <laughs> um, you think you maybe, maybe. I mean, like I said, I found a lot of spiders and stuff like that. Are there any other questions? That was a lot of material. So Sorry. Think, think about it for a second. Okay. I literally Scott. planted seed questions in this audience. <laughs> yeah. So you found that the highest diversity Coast. Yeah. Uh, it also looks to me that maybe the, the greatest diversity of like peach types was there. So do you think, I mean, oh, yeah, that's a good what, 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 what else do you think might explain that? Well, you know, again, I was kind of like, I was, was getting at this idea of the environmental factors as, as being, you know, what it means to be at a particular latitude. And John was pointing out that, you know, there's also like an evolutionary lineage that is associated with latitude. And, and so I was wondering if some of it was that, you know, you have this what is it, the Oregonian complex and the San Diego complex, and there's this really long transition zone between them, and I, I think that maybe that transition zone would just be a particularly specious area. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I was thinking, but a lot of that spread in Central California was monastery, like monastery was driving that. So yeah, I, I hadn't, I should have thought of the fact that beach types, but that might be it. I had a really hard time finding reflective beaches in Southern California and a really hard time, well, a slightly harder time, less hard time at finding dissipated beaches north of here, but um, you know, like the one out here is an intermediate, so it's like most of them fall somewhere in between. But yeah, that that might be it for sure. We only identified 266, yeah, out of 8,000. So yeah. what's the? I mean, would that just be further study? Yeah, like so it's probably my, like myofauna's in it. We just don't have sequences to compare them against. Um, you know, so like I said, a lot of it was bacteria, a lot of it was 
plants and protists and things like that, but some of that that diversity is, is myofauna that we just can't identify for sure. No, 7,800 species, that's not many, what? correct? Or is that a lot? Well, so, so that's what I was saying is, um, you know, the, the percentage that I could I assign was low or like on the lower end of, of other studies that I've seen, but overall diversity, I actually think it was comparable, maybe still a little on the lower end. Like when you described it, that people had thought that it was similar to a, a desert, basically. Yeah. And, but you're saying 7,800 is a really high number. I mean, from zero, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I, and I think the fact, what really matters is that we were able to capture a lot of the taxonomy you know, so when you go back to that chart and you underline the things we could pick up, like even if it's not a lot of species, it's a lot of taxonomic diversity, which in this case perhaps was more more important. Yeah. I think you have to you have to think carefully about what's what's myofauna and what's not. These, this is all DNA found mm -hmm. in the sand, mm -hmm. so it's all myofauna. Yeah. yeah. That's, well, so, what about eDNA though? I've been thinking a lot about that. Okay, there's a little e Emily can address that. <laughs> Stuff that slops off your arms. Um, yeah, I wondered about that. But so you know, so if you have you have thousands of OTUs, and remember this, these are not species, right? Because we're using a gene which is very conserved. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that true. that sequence may represent many many different species. Mm -hmm. We just you know they all, they all just look the same. This, at the level that with we this lens, with this filter, they all look the same. But um, so yeah, so it's 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 huge. Potentially, could be a rainforest. Yeah. Well, yeah. I would. And, and remember, say yeah. it's a few grams of sand. Yeah. Ten grams. Yeah. I guess I didn't say that, but I extracted from ten grams, which is you know like that much. It's it's really not a lot. So that's yeah. I think that's really powerful in that regard. So I can. The slide you, you said you found spider, you found spider OTUs, yeah. but like how many myofauna mite sequences oh. are there in, in the database? Um, well, actually, I don't know about in the database, but uh, the percentage of marine mites is is very low, actually, compared to terrestrial. On the beach. Yeah, that's true. So this is just an example where you, you may have found a sequence, the best match you can find in the database oh, is a related yeah. species. So mites and spiders are related. That's true. And the sequence may they resemble each other. So when you look in the database, it's the closest thing you can find. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, to keep that idea in mind that there's there's the best match and then there's a true match, which yeah. are not necessarily the same. Yeah. That's true. I had a question. Yeah. Um, if you go back to one of your earlier slides um, where you looked at chlorophyll. Oh, yeah. And chlorophyll, in your statistical analysis, chlorophyll fell out. It was not, yeah. But if you look at the. Okay, it made sense backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This one. Yeah. We're on slide 45 there. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it was a higher correlation than temperature. If you took that one point, that one point out at the right, you yeah. had a pretty, pretty decent uh, negative slope. Yeah, that's, so, and it's the same with salinity. Like there's one point that's really dictating the way that parses out. So like, yeah, well, if you look at temperature and salinity, it's, you have a higher correlation, but a slope which is pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. Something like that one point in the corner, you're pretty strong and you're strong. So I was kind of surprised how yeah. chlorophyll didn't turn out to, to be more to important. Show signal. Yeah, and I, you know, a lot of myofauna, the problem, you know, I was trying to think of, you know, how does chlorophyll fit into the, the biology, you know, are they, are they feeding on some of these things? But the problem is, is you have so many life history, th um, you know, life history traits accounted for, you know, they're not, there probably are things that are, are feeding on chlorophyll, but overall, I don't, you know, so I was just, I was trying to think of how strong a predictor I expected it to be. A, a, a metric of, of, of productivity. A marker of yeah. productivity 
more eutrophic communities or mutual of us Yeah, true. Yeah, I, I, yeah, again, there's so much more that I haven't said that I'm still thinking about, and that's, that's this kind of, and why salinity would be so important is another one that I'm kind of looking into. Yeah, well, we're such a small, actual range. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't know what a YSI was when I went out and sampled. I wish that I had, because I would have brought one with me. My mom did. What made you pick those sites? Oh man, I gotta go all the way back to that. <laughs> I have a slide for this. Um, so there's a Scotia, Scotia et al. paper that did a similar study of diversity on rocky intertidal species. And so this was a map that they came up with. And this was kind of the experimental design that I was mimicking. And so a lot of my places are the same. Uh, and the benefit that they had over me was that they were able to replicate within uh, each zone and I was, I was kind of not. So, you know, I have this area term in my models that you never saw because site and area were, were basically the same because there's only one site in each area. Um, but the reason that I had initially picked it was because, you know, they had all of this groundwork mapped out with regards to where buoys were close to things and, and this is what I based it off of. And, they did two transects in the intertidal, and you know I did two transects. So I basically went on Google Maps and went to all these sites, and then like went up and down the coast and found a sandy beach that was nearby, and that was how I dictated it. I I don't know that I would do it this way again um, because they're using wave buoys, and I needed shore buoys, which I didn't know at the time. But uh, yeah. If you were to go back and resample all those spots that you had resampled, but you wanted kind of would what, like to do, but um, the beach changes as far as yes. slope goes. So yes. how would that factor into? A lot, that? and slope is hard. So I had originally, originally what I wanted to do was I wanted to, to get enough, so you know, when you call something reflective, that's a, that's a term, but there's a lot of math behind it. Like it needs to meet X, Y, and Z physical criteria, and one of them is beach slope. And so I really did actually want to categorize each beach as being one of those things, and slope is one of them. But it turns out that it's actually really difficult to measure slope if you're only going to a place one time. The way that they do it most of the time is you have like a, a marker that is always a stable marker, and you go out and you measure it repeatedly, and that's how you get an estimate. And so I, I didn't ultimately end up including a lot of my beach slope data in this, but uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying is like beaches change so dynamically in time, and myofauna have these short generation times, so they, they can respond rapidly to change, which is another reason they're a good you know bio indicator. But that's why I want to do that is you know we have this snapshot and now like look at one place really intensely. And that sand is huge. It's huge, yeah. I'm not surprised that there's not much there. The Unico to you part was exciting, but I, I can never be the same after that, honestly. Um, and Linus basically wore the same outfit to come help me sample there. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you do? I'm so, I think we're way behind. We, we have have yeah. Meeting yeah, we're hours. way behind. Sorry, everyone. No, I can talk to I see you all the time. <laughs> all right, so thank you, Amanda. Come on, plant.